on today's Story Beat. Don't stop. I kind of got inspired by Stallone, you know, years ago who made Rocky and, you know, he fought to keep himself in the movie, to be the actor in the movie. And they wanted to put somebody else in the movie and he wanted to do it himself. They wouldn't let him do it at first, but he fought and he saw it through and he wrote it and he was the actor in the movie. And it really inspired me. And that's why, like, I have worked so hard to make my own projects because People don't come to your door and say, hey, I got a movie for you. Here's a million dollars, go make it. You have to do it yourself and find a way to make that project. And you know, if you don't do it, it'll never happen. And then you'll just be this person later in life who complains about, well, I could have done this if I had money, but like, you just have to find a way. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, writer-director Richard Blakewell, is a veteran cinematographer and television camera operator who's worked with major media figures like Gordon Ramsay and Oprah Winfrey and on noted TV docuseries such as Cops, Last Chance You, and Cheer. Richard has written and directed the feature film Roswell Delirium as a response to both his own journey back from PTSD and the global response to the 2020 pandemic. The film stars 1980s legends like Anthony Michael Hall, Lisa Welchel, Dee Wallace, Reginald Vell Johnson, and Sam Jones. I've seen Roswell Delirium and can tell you it's a complex story set in the 1980s that explores the emotional depths of a strong-willed young woman driven to uncover her own truth, even as she faces her own destruction. I highly recommend you check out Roswell Delirium. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a truly great pleasure for me to welcome the multi-talented Richard Bakewell to Story Beat today. Richard, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure to have you on board. So let's go back in time just a little bit. How old were you when you first started paying attention to moving images? Uh, I would say like four or five. My dad took me to see Star Wars and I wasn't really sure how things worked. I thought people were actually alive on the screen. I didn't know there was just like a TV project, <laughs> you know, projector in the in the theater, you know? So I thought there was like real people the entire time. And I was as hooked like at four years old. I just, you know, like I had like every Star Wars figure and then it just kind of like went on to Empire and Back to the Future. And I just knew that's the kind of road I wanted to go down. That's you know, making movies and everything. So you were mesmerized early on. Oh, very much so. Like I was the weird kid who always watched too much TV. My mom would be like, you watch way too much TV. I'm like, well, I, I think looking back, you know, maybe, but I also was kind of like learning how things work. And I was really just... That's what I wanted. You know, I was kind of like learning the craft and at a very early age, because like when I was like 13, I was like making like home movies and editing stuff that I put together, you know, so I was already doing little projects at 13, 14. So I think I was always just kind of like absorbing what I was watching, you know, for later on. Did you get training anywhere at some point? Yeah, so I uh, went to Columbia College uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. and I went there for directing, but then realized quickly that people who had graduated were still uh, like kind of doing like the lowest job possible four years out of school. And I'm like, well, I can't really afford to, to live like that and be, you know, making $100 a day. So I decided to kind of go into cinematography and learn a trade. That way I would have, you know, something to do until I got those directing jobs, because they don't just hand you a directing job. You have nope. to like spend your time and earn your keep before you actually even get called upon to do that. Unless so. you're super rich. That, yeah, you can buy your own, uh, you know, m movie or role that way. Yeah, exactly. So, but I am not. So I come from a very humble uh, lifestyle. So. so you became a camera guy. I mean, ultimately you've yep. also written and directed. We'll talk about that in a bit, but you started as a camera guy or what sometimes are lovingly referred to as gearheads. Um, oh yes. And so when did your fascination with cameras begin? Was it this, it wasn't at the same time. I think when I, like my friend had like this weird 
old school camera called a PXL 2000. It shot black and white on a cassette tape. And, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it was this weird, like $200 toy that they sold to kids. And when I saw that, we just like recorded everything and we would just watch it like every day and just you know, always filming something. So I think about 14, 15, I was really just in, like playing with all the, the cameras. And then, you know, when I graduated high school, my mom bought me a camera for, you know, in my present. So I just started filming everything that I could, you know, possibly film, you know, any, any experience in the dorms that we, you know, we were at, uh, anytime we were out and about having a good time in a party, just filming that too. It's always documenting everything. So cinematography, as you, I don't have to tell you, is all about light and then what do you yes. get in the frame and so on and, and various other technical or chemical elements to it. What do you think about it that fascinated you? Was it the imagery itself or was it the technology? What fascinated you the most? I, th I think for me, it was just the, the storytelling aspect. You know, it's like I have the power to tell a story, uh, whether it's you know, someone doing something really stupid or something, you know, really funny or serious and capturing that moment in time. It is really, it was amazing just to always have that to go back on and look at. So I think just the ability to tell a story, whether it was, you know, a moment in time with my friends or something that I was doing, you know, as like a little script that I wrote and wanted to film it, you know, I think it just like, because video and movies they're there forever they don't go away they're always around so it's like that's like a always a staple point in life so i think you're making a wonderful point which is that i think many right. people think that other than the writer and director no one else is a storyteller on the set not even the actors nope. are storytellers it's the director and the the writer but in fact as a cinematographer you are a storyteller correct oh you you totally are i mean you see everything through your eyes and it's like sure that you know you need like the, the right lenses and cameras and lighting but it's also how you compress the images into the frame you know it's like what what are you showing the audience in that moment you know it's like i really learned uh doing a lot of verite shooting in my younger days how to like tell a story and you know almost like when know when to go and like pan over it and get the, the other shot you know it's like oh like we had one time this this person on cops who was like about 85 years old and he was drunk driving and uh pulling him out of the car and i didn't show it right away but like he was wearing like a, a cheerleader outfit <laughs> you know and i'm like but i didn't reveal that at first i just kept it very tight you know so when he started walking away i just kind of like zoomed oh. in and like tilted down <laughs> to his like skirt you know and and people just thought that was so hilarious, but it's like, you really can just make you know, people feel a certain way by how the camera moves all the time. So. Well, how fascinating, because truthfully, what you just said was, it's not always what you show, but frequently what you don't show and then reveal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, it's like the reveal. The reveal is very important too, a lot of times, you know, it's like, you don't always want to give things away. It's like, it's good to kind of lead up to something. And it's like, well, I know this is going to be a good laugh somewhere. So I'm just going to wait, hold on until there's the right moment. And then that's when I, you know, zoomed in on them. So a lot of time has gone by in the making of movies over a hundred years. And sure. early on, people would show you what they meant to show you unless it was violent or sexual. And then it right. would be off camera. So there again, yep. you're leaving that to the imagination of the audience. But in fact, time has changed all that where we now see most everything don't we oh yeah we sure do so it's really it's it's like we get information way too fast nowadays so i think we've become so numb to everything that we see anymore it's really crazy how the world's changing so how long I, did you work as a cinematographer before you felt like yes i really am good at this i i probably worked uh as a cinematographer for like 10 years and then I directed my first feature film like about eight to nine years ago. And, you know, it, it's still like, you know, to take on the reins of a feature film is very difficult because, you know, we had like police cars, we had gun effects, we had child actors and animals in the movie. So, you know, fake rain. So all the things that you shouldn't do in a first movie, I was <laughs> doing it all because I was like, well, if we're going to like fail, we might as well fail very big, you know, so um and maybe have a like, little fun at the same time oh yeah we had we i mean we had fun like i mean we got like this crazy dog and to do some amazing tricks in the movie i mean just i mean it's like wow you know it's like all these great moments you capture but and then you learn okay well the dog is not responding to the actor so we cannot do this close-up shot with the actor so we we're gonna pull the actor out take his shirt and put it on the dog trainer and then that way they'll 
we'll get those shots, you know, because that's the only way the dog is responding to the animal trainer. So it's like you learn those little things pretty quick and then you just start to really develop your acting skills with your other fellow actors, how to really address everything and how to bring them along the journey, you know. Well, I've made one movie with a dog as a co-star, and so I get it. I understand. <laughs> and it really you really are depending on that trainer and how well trained that dog is. Oh yeah. And and for us, like the dog was just so hyper, it wouldn't calm down. And I'm like, you're really like it a scene that should take him like an hour took like three hours. And I'm like, oh boy, we're losing so much time because this dog is he just couldn't handle all the people, you know, he just didn't know how to adjust to all the people in the room. So then we had to pull everybody out. You know, it's all these things you just learn because it's like no one tells you how to work with a dog. You have to figure it out yourself. So the dog that I had was the least complaining actor on set. That dog didn't <laughs> complain about anything. <laughs> Right, exactly. So let's go through a bit of your process as a DP. Well, we're going to get down the road here. We're going to get to directing and writing, but let's talk sure. about cinematography for, for this period. When you receive a script or a documentary concept that you're going to go shoot, mm -hmm. either of those, what is it that you start to do? Do you immediately form visuals in your head as you're reading it or where do you start? Well, I think after the first read, I, I start to I, like visualize where this is going to take place. What are the locations? And then it's kind of breaking down. OK, maybe these are like these would be some good shots here, good shots there. Uh, really just uh, a full like lighting plan too. you know, a lot of times when you're doing a movie, you have to really like even though you have a director who might be great, a lot of times they don't know how to like tell the DP what they want. So they're just, they let you just figure it out. And it's like, well, so you're not really collaborating with me. You're just letting me do what I think I should do, but you're not telling me what to do. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer to be told what to do or do you prefer to be left well, alone? I mean, I like to, I like to kind of be left alone, but also have an idea of where you want to go visually, you know, with lighting, the look, you know, I don't want to have to like depend on myself to make every decision as a DP, as a director, that's fine. But like as a DP, I need someone to kind of like say, this is like, this is a reference. Like, look at this movie for that reference or look at that lighting plan for this reference. You know, this is what I am thinking. And then I can build on that. But if I don't have a guideline, I can't really, you know, do much with it. So just, but do what I think, you know. Can, can you tell when you start to work with a director that perhaps their background is not uh, that deep in lighting and, and camera and that you're going to have a little bit of a, a time getting that out of them? Well, you know, I've I've had that before in the past where I've done like some commercials and uh, other projects, music videos, and they just kind of like sat back at Video Village and didn't really give much of an input. It's like, oh, OK, so I guess whatever I'm doing is fine, but they're not really telling me anything different. And I just kind of like started directing, you know, even not getting the credit for it, but I was directing the set and the, and the actors because they were just too busy staring at a monitor. And I'm like, well, you're not really helping. You're just kind of watching a live show. I need you to be there with, you know, out there, but they just wanted to sit back and watch it all happen. So I don't think they really knew what to do. And a lot of times people get thrown into that position and then it's like, you have to help them along the way because it also affects your job too. So. Well, sure. Cause you don't want to be uh, attached to a movie that doesn't work at all. Yeah. And you have to really, a lot of times, you know, when you're doing a smaller project, you have to really lift people up because a lot of times people don't have the experience or the knowledge. So you have to like, when you have time, kind of babysit them and like, you know, this is how you do things. Even simple things like feeding the crew. It's like, well, you have to like make sure we, we break at a certain amount of hours. We can't like go 10 hours and not eat. We have to keep going. We have to be re you know refueled. So there's all these little things you have to tell people along the way. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, it, they're relying on you because you're experienced and maybe they're not so much. Right. And it's like, it's a fine dance too, because you don't want to be the difficult person on set because they don't know a lot. And then you have to like slowly say, Hey, look, you know, uh, you kind of messed up yesterday when you told everybody we were done and then we had to unpack everything and rebuild it again. You know, it's like, you can't really keep doing that. That's like maybe one time ever, but you cannot do a false rap. You have to really know when you're done for the day you know mm -hmm. that can be tricky can't it oh yeah it's very tricky and you know, there's a lot of situations and you know people who work in the business on the crew side we we get very temperamental at times because we work so hard and we mm -hmm. don't sleep a lot mm -hmm. so a lot of, like sometimes you know people can just overreact by having to move some lights around you know and it's like because they don't want to do it oh the lights are already in place you know so that you have to really 
just people have to really tread lightly on a production. It's like there's so many egos and things happening that aren't always perfect and you have to like just try to help keep the ship going all the time all right so once you are on a project and it's a full green light and you know you're going into production what are the steps that you start to take toward preparing for the shoot where do you begin is it is it breaking down the script first or do you um start to gather people and equipment where do you begin well, for me, I start to break down the script. You know, I kind of go scene by scene. Uh, I like to just kind of go through it all, figure out, okay, this is this is going to be a challenge. We might have some visual effects here. You know, this might be uh, something where we have a lot of like inserts to shoot, and we might have an actor for only a few hours. So we'll just have someone else do the inserts with the, you know with hands and use like the you know their wardrobe. Yeah, you know, there's all these little things you start to worry about because you don't like, you know, you're trying to also protect everybody on set, the director, everybody. For me, it's like, okay, what camera are we going to use? You know, that's very important. And then what lenses are we going to use too? What kind of look do we want? We want something very vintage, very, you know, very clean, very video-y. You know, how do we want this movie to look or this project to look? So it's like, for me, it's like starting to kind of like take an idea of how everything should look and what tools. And then from there, watch other like previous commercials movies to get an idea of that is what i want to do that's the kind of look i want to achieve in this project so that's a it's aided if a director has a vision already and says to you oh, look yeah. at xyz movies or or tv shows or whatever and that gives you a clue as to what you need to do versus you having to figure it out on your own exactly and you know you, you, you hopefully when you have a good director it's like Oh my God, it's amazing because then you, they know like what they want exactly. All you have to do is just like work together and then you just kind of offer ideas. And because a lot of times they know exactly what they want. And it's like, oh, this is how it should be. You know, you, you have it all figured out in your head where a lot of people don't, they just show up and figure it out there. And I'm like, you know, that's not really a good plan because you're losing time that way. You know, like you have to come in prepared beforehand. You know, when I direct, I have shot lists. I have everything broken down. I have the, even the lens choices. I mean, I know everything I want based on the script. So it's like a lot of people just walk in and it's like, well, whatever you want to do. And I'm like, well, that's not a good solution. You have to really be thoughtful and have a plan because you have to like go from one scene to the next and you don't have the luxury of 13 to 18 hours. You have 12 hours usually to shoot something. That's it. So once you're on set, the the person I assume that you spend a lot of time interacting with beyond the director, which I assume that you spend plenty of time with them. Sure. Uh, but would be th then be either your first AC, your first camera person, and mm -hmm. or the first assistant director. Those are the people you would mostly interact with, I would assume. Oh, yeah. Like the first AC, you know, very crucial and having them just have all the gear and like know how to build it, put it together, you know, and just really work with the second AC and then, you know, always kind of knowing, like, I do a lot of shoots for Subaru as the DP. So, like, having an AD who kind of knows the time schedule and, you know, always working with him, be like, hey, how long do I have until you need us? Like, what is my actual time frame? And what is, like, the, the, the wish list, like, of how long I have? Uh, that's very crucial. And also, like, the gaffer is so important because a lot of times you're lighting celebrities, you're lighting, you know, older people, and you have to really put up like diffusion, certain lights, you know, and it's like, you have to work closely with them to make sure that everything is balanced and you're not just wasting time and you know, letting the gaffer do whatever he wants. It's like, well, we're never going to see that way. This is the way we're going to look only. So don't worry about that world. Worry about this world, this little mm -hmm. box right here, you know, so that he, the gaffer is probably second to the, you know, the AD as far as like the importance level for me. So, cause we're always working, talking together, even when I'm handling stuff with the camera, I'm going back to the gaffer and seeing how far they are to help the AD, you know, coordinate the whole day more or less. If you don't plan out your day, you really run into trouble quickly, don't you? Right. And then, then your day becomes like, okay, I get, let, that shot's gone. That shot's gone. And that looks bad on you that you can't make your day. And usually whenever I've worked on a project, we've always kind of gone finished earlier or, we, you know, we added more shots that weren't on the schedule. So that's, I like to work fast and efficient. And I think that comes from like my first few years doing reality TV. It's like, it made me really think quickly. It's like, you don't have time to really like think everything out. So like there you just really rapid think over and over again. So I think that helped me a lot for doing narrative projects where I would 
I already have everything mapped out. So when people ask me, there's no pause. It's like, I already have a decision, you know, made up about what we're going to do next. So producers must love you then. Oh, they do. Oh yes. Oh yes. They definitely love me. So, you know, you hire the best people to support you, make yourself look good, but also to make them look good too, because we're not ever trying to like work against each other. It's like, we're trying to like achieve the same goal and the same project together and have a success. We don't want a failure. It's like, and sometimes you work hard and things don't turn out, but like you want it to be the best it possibly can. So well, the, the audience has no idea. There are a thousand people trying to pull together the, <laughs> the one thing and you're really no. all trying to tr tell the same story, aren't you? Right. We're trying to tell the same story and, you know, try to do it in a timely fashion too. And, and, you know, it's like, we work so hard just to create like a false moment in time, you know, and it's, it's so important to really capture it and to have, you know, the right tools and make it look the best it absolutely can. So what is it that you want or need from producers that would be helpful if every producer gave that to you? Well, you know, I think a lot of times they, uh, they like to dance around the idea of the budget. You know, it's like, well, if you were just completely straightforward with me about how much money we could spend, that would allow me to pull favors and get you like better shots. Like I get a steady cam person here this day, you know, or maybe that day, but they're always so like secretive about the budget. They always say, Oh, we're over budget. But I'm like, well, what production is not over budget? Of course you want to like come under, but you know, they never really are truthful about how much money we can really spend. You know, it's like, well, if you give us a couple thousand more on this day, I can give you a jib. I know someone who can bring it in for you know a certain price, you know, but they always wanted to keep that like, that information secretive. So it really would be helpful if they would just be honest about this is what we have and we can work with you on. And this is what we can go over on, you know. Interesting. The So it's a question of whether everything has been laid out on the table for you or whether you have to sometimes fight for things, I assume. Right. And sometimes you fight, but then you realize, wow, they had more money than we thought because like I remember I was doing this one show last year and it was like a two person interview with, Missy Elliott and Little Wayne. And I'm like, oh, you know, I fought to get all these other tools for this, you know, this shoot is like, we had five cameras that we had to, you know, have together for the, you know, two close ups on each and a wide shot. And then you, you go inside to the uh, studio and you realize, look at all these producers that are here. People flew from all these different states to be here, but I had to fight to get a second monitor. You know, it's like, wow, okay. You know, it's like really this, <laughs> you, you see how it works. I'm like, so there is money, but you're just not going to give it to us. We're the you're ones not, who suffer. You know? you're, you're not saying that sometimes people on motion picture productions are cheap, are you? Oh, I would never say that. No, but, <laughs> but I will. Yeah, no, they really, this, like, it seems like the crew side and, the gears where they always try to like shortchange everything. It's like, well, you know, I think just let us, just give us the tools because we're going to make you look the best as you sure can you be. Yep. You know, it's like, if I don't have a second monitor, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to see all the other cameras, you know. How often then does it happen where you're dealing with people that just unfortunately don't know what your job is and don't understand what your needs are. So they don't think of what it is that you need in the first place. Well, I think uh, that is probably like a 70, 30. So 70% of the time they don't know. They don't understand um, what it is you do. So they can't, they can't guess in advance what it is that you'll need because they don't know what you need. No. And some people like, I have some clients who will, I like, just throw money at something. They don't know what to do. So they just like throw money at it. I'm like, well, that doesn't really help. You know, it's like, I, you can let me get all the gear that I want, but I need the people to operate it. You know, uh, like I have uh, a few productions where, you know, we might have multiple locations and I'm like, well, here's the thing. We need people to drive like minivans or vehicles for us. We can't be worrying about our cars and going back and forth. We're going to be going to four locations in a day. We need someone to transport us. You know, it's very important to have those, those tools in effect, like, you know, four PAs for four cars to, to take us along the way. So we're not wasting time trying to like find our cars. So there's like 40 cars going on a production instead of like four or five instead, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You already spoke or mentioned a shot list or shot lists. Right. Uh, which is something that you do with a director. I assume that's most of the time it's with the director. Sure. So for the listeners that don't know, tell us what is a shot list? What is its purpose? Well, the shot list is to basically break down each scene. So a lot of times when you watch a, a scene in a movie or a TV show, you know, it's like a few close-ups and a wide shot, you know, that's pretty much what you see. And for 
the importance of this of the shot list is to kind of break down each scene so then you know how many shots we are allowed to do per scene it's like okay well this is a, a scene that takes one minute of time screen time so we're only gonna allow like four or five shots total that's it and you know like what and then we have to, have to kind of make a marker of a wet shot can we like lose if we're behind time you know and really it's like telling uh the director and myself it's like okay well we have you need two close-ups here maybe two takes on this one uh maybe only one take on this camera and then maybe one this wide shot of the first two minutes of the scene you know we're just kind of breaking down each scene as it happens and then sometimes uh, for a shot list, you have other factors, like you have multiple cameras going, you have to kind of factor in, or you have a jib or steady cam, and so you have to really be efficient uh, with your time, but the shot list will help you kind of like build your uh, your scene, and then so you're not wasting all this time worrying about, oh, lighting, moving things around, and it helps you really look at the perspective of like, okay, well, we're going to start in the wide shot, and then we're going to go close up, close up close up and then maybe if we have time a dolly shot and then inserts if we need them you know so really it helps you kind of build the scene and the time frame so is it more complicated for you when you have multiple cameras to light it and to prepare it or is it actually well, more complicated yeah. to have a single a single camera setup single camera is easy because you're only looking one way and then when you usually you were, you were you're having like two to five cameras you're kind of now going into a 180 world or sometimes 270 so you're seeing a whole lot more and then, you know, then you're flagging off so much, so much light and then you have to compensate and you're losing and some lights have to be hung. And so no longer can they be on the ground. I mean, there's just a lot of factors. Having multiple cameras really slows you down. It, it's it's good for like coverage, but it also it really eats into time because you have to like almost have a 180 all the time. So like that way uh, you can do like sometimes two people talking at the same time, having a conversation and that just really uh, eats up a lot of lighting time because then it's like, well, they look great, but they look terrible. So now it's like, how do we fix that? You know, and you're always adjusting, putting the floppy up or putting up some diffusion, but it's, it's complex, but you have to really work so close with your gaffer to achieve, you know, the multiple camera situation. Explain for those who don't know what you meant by 180. So, uh, you know, basically 180 is like the line of, you know, of filming, like you don't break the 180 rule. I always say, it's almost like the proscenium arch on the right stage. so like here's here's a straight line and like this is the world that we see you know it's basically just like half basically like half we're seeing half of oh if there are four walls we're seeing half of that you know to mm -hmm. break it down that way mm -hmm. uh when you're multi-camera sometimes you're seeing three out of four walls so that really just eats into your lighting world because now you can't hide things like you could before so you really by giving up even this 180, like you're really just having to compress shots and really having to really fine tune the lighting and, and waste like almost double the time to get like multiple camera coverage. Can you share with us an experience in which a director made your life a lot easier? What, what do you want out of a director that makes your life better? I, I think for me, uh, you know, like I did uh cheer a couple of years ago and you know, I was basically flown down to do the big competition because a lot of us that were flown down had done Last Chance U for a few seasons. So the director, Greg Whitley, he basically had uh, another camera person film the rehearsals of their performances. And we basically had to watch the video over and over again and then figure out what our shots were going to be. So we were on like some very long lenses and I had like 34 marks to hit in a two minute time span. So I had to go wow. from like this person across the stage, go back to the middle, find this person over here, stage left and go back and forth. But I had to hit 34 marks in a two minute time span. Wow. Uh, and, but he had it all broken down and it was really helpful. So like for me, it was like, I watched the video, we talked about it over and over again. And then like having, uh, having him be so prepared it helped me learn the, the uh, routine and then keep it down to a dance. Like here we are backstage, you know, I would have this whole little like thing in my head. I would just say out loud to myself when I was filming, cause you're snapping back and forth and grabbing a shot for three, four seconds and then going on to something else, you know, someone jumping across stage and doing a flip. And I mean, he was just so prepared and we had, I think nine cameras on that. And it really just saved time because 
you know, if we were just out there filming by ourselves without like any like uh, rehearsal footage to look at, we would have never gotten the coverage that we did. You know, I mean, I mean, it looks beautiful when you watch it all cut together because we hit every moment possible. So nine cameras sounds like a sporting event. It well, it is. And like, you know, like that show and Last Chance You, you know, like when they film the Verite, it's like two cameras. But like when you're filming the sports aspect, they want every possible thing filmed, like audience, they want the families, you know, other players. So, you know, the, the cameras being spread out and covering everything is really helpful to tell the story uh, because it is a pretty like high value, like Netflix production. So they really want it to feel like you're at, you're at the game and you're at the competition. It's so important to them for that, you know, so they spend the budget on the sports days. Is it impossible to do multiple takes in that circumstance? With cheer, we're, you know, it's pretty much impossible because they're only allowed to come on stage for that competition moment. You know, so they come on, they compete day one and then day two, and they have a, a timeline of other everybody else coming through the schedule. So if we don't get it, uh, we miss it, you know. And I remember one camera guy they brought in, he forgot to record. And oh, so we, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and he was in the pit, you know, with everybody. So they lost that shot and were pretty upset about it. And as, as I was, I, you know, it's like, you should have said something, you know, not to wait till it was over. You know, he didn't know where the button was. He got nervous. And I'm like, you should have said something, you know, he didn't so press we, the button because he didn't know where it was. Yep. Wow. Wow. So it, you know, it was a little, a little heartbreaking, you know, it's like, if you did, like, you have to speak up, like you, you have to like, not be embarrassed. You have to say, you know what, I'm sorry. I don't know this camera as well as I should. Where is the button? You know, it's like so just, in, in cinema verite, you really don't get second chances really too often. Oh no. Uh, I, I remember, you know, doing this documentary years ago. Uh, it's called before I die with kids doing their bucket list, you know, like a cancer documentary that's still being filmed. And uh, I remember, the first day I went to this little like yurt in Denver, Colorado, the family was celebrating their, their son who had died a year ago and all their friends came out. And, you know, I spent like four hours filming uh, like them and out there and the mom was crying and the, you know, the families were crying. And then I put the camera down for like, I think 10 minutes and they start talking to me. And then one of like the kid's best friends goes, Hey, Last year, remember what we were doing a year ago? And then they're like, what? She goes, making tacos. And they all started bawling like crazy. They like, it brought back this emotional moment because when they were making tacos, he like collapsed. And then he, he they had to bring him to the hospital because he was going to not make it, you know? And, and I missed his beautiful moment. And I'm like, because I was having a conversation trying to like get close to the family and, you know, and attach. And, and I was like, wow, I never forgot that. I like I lost that fantastic moment that I'll never get back. So you know? as a documentarian, if that's what you want to classify yeah. yourself at that moment, you kind of also almost have to be ruthless, don't you? You do. You have to really be ruthless. You have to really stay in there. I mean, I remember uh there were times when I filmed cops and uh, you know, people would like look at me and yell at me to get the camera out of my face, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to back down. So I walked like four or five steps closer to them to be like, look, you're not going <laughs> to intimidate me. You know, it's like, you can try to attack me and some people would attack me and I'd have to fight them off and the cop would hit them, you know, whatever. But it's like, you're, I'm not going to like step down because of you. It's like, I'm here to film and that's just, you're going to have to deal with it. You know, you're not going to tell me what to do out here. So you have to really hold your ground uh, and be ruthless and really just show your presence out there. Like even, um, doing other projects where, you know, like I did intervention too for a while and you have to really be delicate when the families are there and they're crying and upset and their, their, their son is an addict and, you know, almost has died himself and you have to really be invisible. You can't really ever show that you're there. It's like, you have to be so quiet. Like you're just a fly on the wall. It's so important. Like you can't be even like talking to anybody else. It's like you do, you're just you're just doing your job filming for hours on end. And then it's like, you're capturing these moments, but you're really just a fly on the wall. Do you need people to sign off on their images that they're, that you're shooting on the fly like that? Oh yeah. So when I did cops, you know, my job was kind of like a, the, the camera operator producer. Cause I had to like figure out what was the story. And if I didn't think it was a good story, I would just stop filming and say, we're done. You know, that's it. Put the camera away. We're not going to film this, you know? And then when we get a good story that we think is going to be airable, you know, it's like the cop puts the guy in the back of the car or whatever. 
And then it's like, I have to go and talk to them and get the release. You know? Hmm. So it's like, it's a very, it's like, it can take sometimes minutes or it can take quite a while. Like, you know, it's like just to really work your relationship is like, like you can't just say, Hey, I want your release, sign this. It's like, you have to like befriend them and talk to them like the person because they are a human. They just made some bad mistakes, but you have to also work them and like try to get them to want to be on the show. And you you tell them, look, this may not make the air, but you're helping me do my job and maybe we can help you out a little bit too, you know? So do, do you uh, ever bump into situations where they just won't sign? You know, there was a couple uh, that then you know, what do they, you do? Where they wouldn't, <laughs> I won't mention names, but there was a couple of times where I couldn't get somebody to sign. They were just not going to let it happen. You know, they were like, they were in a gang and they weren't going to like sign. And, uh, the cop told me to walk away. And and then when I walked away, I came back and all of a sudden they wanted to sign, you know, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know what was said, but there was, you know, maybe some yelling happening in the background, but, uh, you know, they sometimes they have to be convinced well, to sign. You know? They probably recognize that their fame and fortune was walking away from them. Exactly. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of times, too, you know, like the, the cops would work with me. It's like, OK, well, like I had one girl who was very combatant and she beat up her boyfriend and she was drunk. And, you know, we put her in the back of the car and she was so sad about going to jail. And I was like, well, you know, she doesn't want to talk to me and she just keeps telling me to go away and. And I said, is there anything that we can do to get her to, you know, want to sign this release? And, you know, the cop goes, well, I can just give her a citation and then send her home. But then she'd probably go to jail later. So <laughs> I so I told her, I said, well, look, if you sign the release, you don't go you don't go to jail tonight. You go you go home. So she signed it. And I'm sure she went to jail later. But she probably did. But it's like that night she went in her own bed, you know, and that's uh, part of the deal is you work out with people. You know, you just kind of make it happen. And it's sure. nothing like. That doesn't happen all. The, I mean, it happens all the time. Like when you get a DUI, the cop will let you to go. You know, he'll like tow the car away, but you can go home. However, when you go to the court, you're probably going to go to jail like at some point. So it's like you're not going to court then or not jail then, but you're going to go to court later on and, and go to jail. So you've obviously worked on a lot of productions where the pressure on you was heavy that you oh, yeah. have to deliver on a timely manner, maybe in a dangerous circumstance and all those things, pressure. What do you do to handle pressure? How do you deflect it or deal with it? Well, I mean, there's always pressure. I mean, I remember uh, one time in Vegas, we were on a standoff for like five hours. This lady had like shot at her husband and tried to kill him because he was cheating on her. And, you know, she kind of barricaded herself in the garage and kept pointing, the, like in, in the beginning, she was pointing the gun at us, but they wouldn't shoot her because I was filming it. And they could have easily killed her, but they wouldn't kill her because I was filming everything and they don't want to like have that on their hands. Uh, and we were on a standoff and it just kept going on and on. And I'm like, it's never going to stop. And my sound guy got so scared. I looked over after an hour and he left. He just, he, he, he bailed on me. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh boy. Uh, and then I, you know, it was like a lot of pressure, more people kept coming, more squad cars, helicopters, you know, and they start bringing like, uh, the beanbag guns so they can like shoot her with beanbags instead of like actual live rounds. And I just remember like, there was so much stress cause that was my first standoff, but like I was on my knees the entire time. So my legs had gone numb. So I just, I forgot about the stress that I was under cause I couldn't feel my legs. So they were so numb. I couldn't even move because she would like yell or do something. And as soon as people start moving out there, you know, and I was like, I can't even move right now because she's going to see it or hear me. So I laid there for like a while with my legs is dead completely. Mm. So it kind of killed my stress level. And then once, you know, they shot her with a bean bag, I had to get up and then I was like stumbling. because my legs were dead asleep, you know? And, uh, but I, I just, you know, I learned to uh, not let the stress get to me. And that didn't happen early on when I was doing cops the first two months, I, would like pray every day and I would like almost be nauseous because I thought this could be the day I get shot and killed out here. You know, I, I didn't know what was going to be the end result of my day. And I remember like after like six, seven weeks of being out there with the cops and uh, we were on a step, like a kind of like a, we pulled somebody over with some guns in the car. And I just remember like putting gum in my mouth and chewing gum. Like it was no big deal. I was like, the nerves kind of like went away. I just learned to slowly put all that stress away and just focus on my shots. You got used to it in a way. Yeah, I kind of got like uh, normalized to it. It became like an everyday thing. Did you then have a technique or something that you did at the end of the day when you went home? Did you decompress in some way? You know, I really, 
like for me, it was like we were pretty spent after a day. So we would just go and look for the footage and submit stuff for stories. And uh, I usually would just kind of like sometimes like sit in the shower uh, for like an hour, you know, and just like let the water hit me and not even think or drive home in complete silence. Because, you know, like on a show like that, you really see the ugly side of the world, you know, like there's so much abuse that happens to children out there in the field uh like things that we never would show but it's like it's so sad to see and like a lot of times you don't want to deal with it you just don't want to think about it so you try to just do things to take your mind off of it and a lot of guys that i worked with you know they would do a lot of drugs or drink a lot but i just tried to like this clear the mind out much as mm -hmm. i could you know just let take a shower drive home and quiet just you know find something to the silence the all the the, the thoughts in my head so. sure well some there are all kinds of different methods right yours is to sure. to to actually decompress by shutting out the the what you've just been through and that helped you to get through it i mean obviously there are yep. people that meditate there as you say there are people that use drugs or alcohol uh, there are people who will go to the gym there's all kinds of different ways yep. I find your way quite soothing, I think, that you go home and go in the shower, but you kind of need to, otherwise you would probably oh, yeah. be pulling your hair out all the time. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like I did that show for two years and I didn't realize what that show did to me mentally. Like it really gave me severe PTSD and I, mean, mm. I wasn't a cop, but I was out there with them a lot of times and having to fight other people with them and fight off people for me. And uh you know, like everything, I was very hypersensitive to every noise. I mean, I was like anybody I saw in a car, I looked like, like, like a bad person. I was really aware of everything. And, you know, it's like out there, you know, I probably s saw like 17, 18 people died on my, in my time, you know, on the, on the streets. And I remember one kid, we were in Arizona uh, and he got hit by a car and his brain was just coming out of the back of his head. <sighs> And he kept saying, I have to get home. My mom's going to kill me. You know, he's, she's going to kill me. And he's like, he got hit. He's on a bike and hit by a car. And, you know, I'm, and he like collapsed in my arms and the cop goes, just drop him. I'm like, well, I can't drop him. He's, he's like dying in my arms. And I, I put him down and he went out and he was gone. And it's like all those things kind of live with you. And then you don't realize how it affects you until like months later, because it's like you go to that call, you see somebody die, and then you're on to the next call. It's like you have no time to process. It's a form of combat photography. Yeah. Oh, it really is. And there's no training for it, too. It's like we spent a week kind of watching videos and talking about things in Santa Monica before we went out in the field. But there's no, like, really anything to help you along the way when you have to watch all this stuff and, you know, see a, a child try to kill themselves because the stepfather is, is raping them every day. You know, you don't... Mm really you don't really have training for that so you just have to deal with it on your own and figure out how to like survive you know well i think it's phenomenal that you have survived it and you're able to move on and have a creative life beyond it that it hasn't wrecked you in some way uh or at least nothing that's obvious you know to the outsider sure sure so yeah. let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what was your very first directing gig not just directing action on a documentary but your actual narrative filmmaking career my my first directing gig was a movie called officer down uh and it was more or less a story that i wrote and directed based on the ptsd that i experienced out in the field uh you know it's uh it's a very complex story. It's about a cop with survivor's guilt who like gets spared. And then they decide that, you know, I don't know why I'm still alive. And for me, that's how I felt out there when people that I knew had died, like cops that I knew. And, you know, we, we had a couple of camera guys die of heart attacks because it's a very stressful job and they died in their sleep, you know, in the hotel room. So for me, it was like a story about really just why am I still here? And that was, you know, trying to like really answer that myself. Uh, but it's also a way of like therapy for me. It's like really to put it out there, what I live through, my thoughts, my feelings, and then put it into other characters. So, well, that's what many artists do is they work through their own personal issues sure. through the art form. Oh yes. Oh and yes. That's what you were doing. So what are the critical elements of a story that works for you? What are you looking for in a story? Is it conflict is it character is it plot what are you mostly concerned with well i think for me like the plot is very important you need to you need to have a direction where you want to go like you need to have a start middle and end you know it's very simple you know the hero's journey you know it's always important 
I think for me, it's like the character, like you really have to have someone that people can love and laugh with, because if you don't, they're not going to cry for that person. You know, I, I really like the story of this, the evolving where it's like, you're watching a story and it's, it, there's humor, but then at, at, towards the end, it starts to build and wow, now it's taking an emotional turn. Now it's a lot different, you know, and I feel the, that's the kind of stories I like telling where it's like, it takes you on a, a journey where you're not just, oh, it's not a comedy throughout. There's some humor, but it's also a very emotional roller coaster as well. So I think the, like having a main character to take you on that journey is very important. So I noticed in Roswell Delirium that you're not the cinematographer. You have someone else working with you. Uh, yes. Is this someone that you knew prior to working on it, or was it somebody you met through the process of setting up Roswell Delirium? Well, uh, I had somebody lined up to go uh, to be the DP who had shot the last movie, and then, you know, he decided to quit a month before production started, you know, and so I went on a fast shopping spree to find the best DP that I could, and I found this great DP named Carter Ross just through, you know, looking up stuff on websites and everywhere, production hub, wherever, and I just really like admired his work and his eye. I'm like, he has a great eye. You know, he's a young guy and I'm like, he has well, a great eye for it everything. Look, it looks great. Thank you. Yeah. And he just like, you know, we met for lunch one day and he brought like a lookbook of all like how the, how the movie should look, the colors, everything, the shots. Cause I said, that's, I said, I really want to reference like ET, you know, some of that warmth of ET in the movie. I want that to be a thing in the movie. And he just, he got it. Like we just clicked right away. And uh, even during the movie, it's like he was so good that I didn't have to worry about the camera department. I could actually go and work with the actors and, you know, some, some rehearsing, some blocking. And he would just run the camera department, the lighting, and, and I never had to get involved ever. So it was like, he really just knew what he was doing. And it saved me so much time because if he didn't, I, I would have lost time and performances with the actors. So despite your being a long time cinematographer, you were able to release the feeling that you had to oversee <laughs> that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's like, I think when you have the right people uh, working for you, it's easy to let go of control. It's easy just to say, you got it. And, you know, for me, you know, there'd be times where I say, actually, I, I, I'm not loving this. Can we just like go in a little closer or, or go a little bit wider, you know? But for like 95% of the time, he got it. He just, we, we had a flow and uh, it was, it was just a very welcoming for a change to actually not have to be so involved with the camera side, you know, to let him do his thing. And that's the way it should be. But like collaborating, you know, it's like, okay, here's what we're doing, but you got it. You know, you have, you have that world all to yourself. Was that a big relief? Oh yeah. Because I mean, we had... <laughs> We didn't have a lot of money to make this movie and you know we had so many child actors so you know we only had those kids for eight hours a day so we really don't have the ability to make mistakes and to figure things out it's like everything has to be thought out before and it was just great for a change to actually say wow you have it I, and i got more shots than i wanted you know we added more stuff uh, where before we i was like you might, you might have to like cross some things off the list. Like, oh, we didn't get that shot. Didn't get that shot. But like with him, you know, I was able to get all the shots. So, so we've, we've already talked about two of what people consider to be the most difficult things to do as a director, direct animals and children. Those are the yes. two. And what was it for you that you were made it easier for you to work with children? Was it the casting itself or was there something else? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, the, the casting was very hard because we couldn't really get people to come out to do like in-person casting again. Like it was hard to even get a casting director to come out and they wouldn't come out of their, their house. They were very scared because it's still 2022. Oh, um, and luckily we had a lot of brave parents who brought their kids to this in-person audition and there hadn't been one in two years. We were like the first one ever to do it. And uh, I remember there was a girl who walked in named Kaden Tokarski and she walked in the room and she hadn't been in an in-person audition in two years and she just nailed it. And I was like, you are Becky the mean girl, like without a doubt. Like, and it was just like, wow. Like seeing that again, like being in that room with the people and getting that energy, like like people like her and other other kids, they really, uh, they were just very confident. And I was like, I don't remember being that confident as a kid uh, where you could walk in a room, command it, and then just leave. And I knew like with the kids that I found, they were going to be great. 
and we did like a rehearsal day because I was worried about like, they have a lot of dialogue and they did a rehearsal and they all knew the lines of everybody else. And I looked at the first AD and I said, we could have shot this today. They're that good. Like they were so talented. They they knew how to be funny when it was time to be funny. Then they knew when to wait for their, you know, their reaction and, and their, and their dialogue. And I mean, they're just, they were so polished to be like 12 and 13 and be so with it. So it made my job easier, but you know, I also like really worked with them and connected, you know, just to keep the right tone going through the movie. And one little kid named Roman Smith who plays Jeremiah, you know, he hates to cuss. Like he's really like, you know, he's a, he's a good kid, but he hates to swear. But I would say, you have to say it like this, you know? And then he's like, S word, S word. He got all nervous, you know? But I'm like, you got to say it like this. And he would just turn bright red and his cheeks were so <laughs> rosy, you know? And I'm like, it was fun to like, and, and that's how like, I bonded with a lot of the kids. We just like would make jokes and, you know, find a way to connect. And that's how I got even better performances out of them, so. Well, I think that the, uh, your performances out of the children in the movie, the the underage people, I guess you'd say, they're not really children they're they're more uh, yeah. young young adults the um i thought that it was they were very consistently good that there was no one in that group that was not you know up to snuff and so i think that must have been very good for you to find it that way and not have it be oh out oh yeah i mean i was worried about like here's all these kids and you know i wanted to make my own 80s movie but i'm like you know it's hard to put kids in a movie and to have them do very well but like mm -hmm. they are all i mean they were all just you know some had had a lot of experience you know caden had played like a younger julia roberts on gaslit you know and uh some of the other kids didn't have much experience at all they did darman this little like youtube show so really it was like levels of experience, but when it came to filming, they were just, they were spot on perfect. And it really just made my life easier because I was like, if things don't work out, I got to start cutting scenes out of the movie. I got to really start cutting people out and I didn't, I didn't have to, I kind of added stuff instead of cutting things out. No, oh, that was fortunate. Um, you, yeah. you mentioned E.T. a little earlier. Well, you have one of the main stars of E.T. in Roswell Delirium and that's D. Wallace. And so I'm wondering, you also had Anthony Michael Hall and Reginald Vell Johnson and, and Sam Jones. I'm just curious, when you're working with someone who's a known entity, a celebrity, a star, however you want to call it, is your working with them different than when you're working with someone who's not famous? You know, for me, like I always say, you treat everybody the same. You know, we had a PA on set named Kevin and he had to do a lot of the work and it's like, on, on productions, people always kind of like treat the PAs very badly, but I always would like check in with Kevin, make sure he's okay. And that's kind of how I am with the actors, no matter what level they are, you know, if they're like Anthony Michael Hall or, or, or D. Wallace or even like an unknown child actor, you know, I really just treat them all the same. I, I, I try to treat them as friends, you know, first and foremost, uh, and gain their friendship. But I don't treat them any differently. Like I really try to treat them like a normal person because I think it's very important to not say, hey, here's a celebrity. Here's D. Wallace, everybody. Here's a celebrity. And everybody don't say anything. You know, be careful. You know, I just try to treat them all the same and equally. And I think it's very important because if you treat them like an icon, you know, they're just going to think you're kissing their butt and not really, that you're a fake person more or less. So it's like I try to treat them like I would my friends, you know, out there on the set. So you're also the writer of the movie. Yes. Did you ever have arguments between the director and the writer on set? Did you ever <laughs> have to fight yourself on something? Uh, no, I mean, I think I had to like dial things back here and there, you know, mm -hmm. because there, there's a lot of like Easter eggs in the movie, a lot of 80s references. And I think there, like at times I would just say, you know what, don't say that at all. Just cut that part out because there's just already so many Easter eggs. I just don't want to fill the movie with too many Easter eggs. So I had to fight myself on that quite a bit, but D Wallace and I, we talked a lot before we even filmed, you know, her scenes and, you know, I wrote it. I thought it was pretty perfect. And then she called me and she's like, you know what? They're going to hate my character. And I'm like, no, they're not. She was, I yell at the waitress and I'm very, I lash out and I, and I, I don't really have a reason to lash out. And then, and then she's like, I, I need a reason to yell at her. And I'm like, well, let's think about that. Then she goes, I got it. She's like, I'll say this happens wherever we go. We don't get to get served. And then it just really helped rationalize her anger of the waitress in the movie, you know, and that was her idea. And so then I 
kind of like wrote that into the script and we kind of made, made that part of the, the scene and then kind of made it uh, so much better. And, you know, instead of just like yelling at her for not serving them, you know, and I, I think like that input really helped me. And then with other actors who have ideas and sometimes their ideas are like, well, it's not very good, but thank you. You know, I appreciate it. But like, that was a really solid point to make. They're playing characters that are actually good, warm hearted people who right. in fact have been pushed to the edge and they can't take it much longer. And so right. I, th I think that that's what you're talking about, that she wanted it to not feel like I'm just a mean, angry person. Exactly. And, and it really gave, you know, her a heart and it made people really uh, get emotional when she goes to Space Rock, you know, later and you see her up there and it's like, because you really identify with her and you really care about her in that, in that little moment at, at the diner and even more so when she's up there, you know, with the, with the rabbit and, you know, it's like she made the character real you know she brought a sense of realism to it like just by adding that little moment of time and uh and that's why i really wanted her from et because sure it's the boy story but like she's the heart of that movie you watch those scenes i mean she has so much stuff where she's so emotional and, and not even talking it's like the non-verbal acting it's like she's so good at it you know and and she told me some stories about her and spielberg where they were doing the first scene in the movie with all the family and the kids. And then she walked over to the sink and started crying because she's upset that the, the father left to go be with another girl and took her to Mexico. And she's upset about it. And then Steven Spielberg's like, why did you walk away? We can't see you. And then she goes to Steven. Well, that mother would never allow her kids to see her crying. So I had, so I had to walk away. So then Steven Spielberg built like a bigger set to show her upset by herself away from the kids. But like, and that's how good she is. She's so committed and she really like takes on the role and really feels it out. And like, what would this character really do? Like there's more to it. And just like coming to day, coming to uh, the set for a day, she really puts her heart and soul into it. Do you find that as a director, you've got to think psychologically how to gear your direction to every individual actor, whoever they are? Oh, yeah, because like days when there's like emotional scenes, you got to deal with a lot of treading lightly moments. You have to tread lightly with your actors. And sometimes you have to tread lightly with egos. You know, people are very vulnerable uh, when they're going to be on camera. So you have to really treat people a certain way. And uh, if you don't, I mean, you're just going to clash like you're really going to like ruin the, the performance. And, you know, I try to give everybody a safe space. Uh, and the one girl, Ash, in the movie plays the older version of Mayday. You know, she'd go to me every time we, we do a take. She goes, 10 seconds. Give me, I just need 10 seconds. And I'm like, you can have as long as you need. But that 10 seconds helped her get into the mindset for the character, you know. And we, we'd always have the slate, like, away from her face. So it wouldn't distract her, you know. Because I'm like, she had to do some pretty hard scenes. And, like, it's just very important to give the actors a safe space to do their work. And knowing that you have to deal with certain egos and other things too, it's all a balance, you know? It's like, everybody's different. There are no two actors the same. Mm -hmm. And that makes it a, a very interesting and big time challenge for the director of the movie who has to oh, be yeah. the psychologist and all roads <laughs> lead through Rome, don't they? Oh, yes. And, and then you also have to deal with the crew too. And, sure. you know, you're, you, know, you're like, you have a first AD who runs a set, but you're still having to make sure everyone's happy and they're not like upset and, you know, having a hard time. Sure. How long have you been writing? Uh, well, I started writing in film school back in like, you know, 1997. So, so, so I, you didn't, you didn't come to it two years ago. You, you've no. been for a while. <laughs> no. And like, you know, for anything I write, like sometimes I do like multiple drafts and then there's some stories that I've written that I like, I find later. I'm like, wow. Like I just like, I gave up on it because I'm like, well, I don't believe in the script. It's I just I can't really keep working on this movie. I don't feel like it's a good script. You know, like, you know, when you have a good story and sometimes you write stuff that's like, well, I tried it. It didn't work out. And I'll just take some ideas for the next script, you know, but like I write all the time and I just you have to really learn when your ideas are working and when they don't work, too. It's really important. Do you write pretty much every day? Uh, I don't write every day, but like, even when I'm out and about, I just get ideas. I really, you know, I just kind of like see things happening in, in the real world. And I just like come home and write down some ideas from what I saw. So even if I'm not writing, I'm like putting together thoughts about what might be a good story idea, a story point, you know, to happen in the film. 
which is more fun for you, writing or being in production? Uh, I would say being in production because writing it just takes so much time. Like it, you know, like I spent from start to finish like three years writing a story and like 17 drafts. And, you know, wow. like, I'm also a working, you know, DP director. So it's like to find the time to write a script when you're working is pretty oh, sure. challenging. <laughs> You know, and you have to like be in the right mindset too to write a script. You can't just like, okay, I'm going to write for four hours. You have to like be ready for it. You have to like be able to sit down and just relax and okay, now let's do it. I think the hardest thing to go through as a writer who also has other work and other things going on is finding that zone, that rhythm, being yeah. able to sort of piece it together and keep going rather than trying to do it in little bits and pieces, which is really challenging to do. It is. And like, and for me, it's like, I would like start on ideas and then be like, I'm just so tired. I can't write anymore. And I would stop, you know, so you're always like stopping, starting. So like, I think if I had the luxury of being a writer full time, it would be a lot easier, but you know, oh, try oh, no, to... oh no, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I think, you know, maybe, it, maybe it isn't that way, but like for me to like, okay, I'm gonna come on for two hours and write and now go to bed. But it's you, like, it's, you would find that you would still have the same issues. It's just that you could piece things together in a little more, more of a smooth flow than when yes. you're distracted by all these other things. Uh, but the act of creation, I don't think no matter how long you've been at it necessarily gets any easier. Sure. Maybe there are things, aspects of it that are a little easier over time, but coming up with something to fill that infamous blank screen or page, yep. <laughs> that uh, that never really goes away. Yeah, I mean, writing it, it takes a lot of thought and in a lot of a lot of time where you have to realize, well, that is garbage that has to get tossed away. Definitely, you know, that, 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 that hard. It's hard to let go of things, but sometimes you know that has to go. Otherwise it's not going to work. So. so, so sets are notoriously distracting places. There's lots going on. It's oh, bad yes. enough when you're the cinematographer and you've got all those things going on, but it's a, even a higher level when you're the director and you have to deal with all of the various departments and all of the psychologies that are going yep. on. What do you do to eliminate the distractions and focus? Are you just a naturally good focuser or is there something you need to do? Well, I'm pretty good at focusing. It's it's funny when I tell people about the behind the scenes of the movie afterwards and you know all the complications that we had, they're they're like I had no idea. And I'm like, and you shouldn't. Like it's not your job to know the things that were going wrong on the day, you know. There was a day where we filmed the school bus scene and they brought the wrong bus. Like <laughs> it was like a 2015 CTA bus with a flat nose and I'm like uh that is not an 80s bus and <laughs> no. so it's like we were on the on the phone calling other places to get there with a school bus that looked like an 80s bus you know it's like trying to keep your composure to keep your calm and that that's how i like to be on set is like very focused i will handle the problems but nobody else will know what those problems are except for like the people who need to like the first ad and other producers like everybody else should be doing their thing, getting a makeup, wardrobe, lighting. You know, it's like they should have no idea what's happening out does, there. Does that philosophy of keeping people f uh, who are into their own jobs, actors and so on, is the idea to keep that from them so that they don't get caught up in that emotion? Well, yeah, because, you know, you lead by example. Like if you start acting panicky and stress and yelling, that rubs off on everybody. I don't, if actors, cast, crew it rubs off. And I, I've seen it in my day. I don't act that way. I will like drive home and then I'll be mad and angry or whatever. And I'll deal with it then. But like, I don't let, ever let anybody see my level of anger or frustration during the day. And, you know, I remember one time when I made my first feature officer down, uh, we were using this recorder device for the camera. And I found out that we lost two hours of footage that we filmed. Oh, <laughs> oh my so, goodness. So, you know, I had to tell everybody to go to lunch early and I took a long walk down a dark alley for like 15 minutes. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? We lost all these performances. We had, you know, a rain machine. We had all this stuff. So it was a lot of stress. And I said, okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to like pick those shots up tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to tell the actors that we need more coverage. I'm not going to tell them that we lost their entire performance because they will, they're not going to be happy and they're not going to act the same tomorrow. 
Did they ever find that out? Uh, they never found out. <laughs> but like for me, it was like if I tell them that they lost the entire scene, they are going to lose their minds. Like, sure, you know, it's like, sure. and their acting is going to be different. They're going to be worried that we're not capturing it this time. Are we getting it? You know, so I really had to, you know, dance around that. And it was, it was very hard. And I was. <laughs> That's a bigger and much more expensive a proposition than the equivalent of writing for a day and then not saving and having the computer <laughs> shut off and losing everything. That's terrifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but when you're dealing with all that money and people, that's really um, not fun. Yeah. And, and so it, you know, that was like a lesson to, to like keep my cool on set. You know, it's like, don't let people see you're panicking, even though it's happening inside, don't let them see it. It'll be, a, it's like, you're going to, you'll eventually re get that footage again. You're going to get it a second time, but if they see you panicking, it's going to, it's going to rub off on everybody and they're all going to start being different. And then it's going to just down the road. So, yeah. So I've been having just the most fantastic conversation with Richard Bakewell, who is a cinematographer and also the writer director of Roswell delirium. And you've clearly met and dealt, dealt with a lot of people in the industry. And I'm just wondering, are you able to share with us beyond the stories you've already told us, Something that's either weird, quirky, offbeat, oddball, strange, or just plain funny. My favorite uh, is with D. Wallace, actually. It was a recent one. And it's just like, during the time, it wasn't funny. But like afterwards, I laughed so much about it. And she's doing this very serious scene up on the side of the mountain. And of course, you know, we're fighting the time of the sun going down. So we have like basically an hour. You know, it's like, it's becoming the golden hour time. You have like less than an hour to go. So, you know, we're only going to get about five or six takes. That's all we're going to be able to get. And it's all on Steadicam. And of course, you know, we we slate, we start rolling. She starts to get into the scene, gets very emotional. And then out of nowhere, this giant freight train comes by, scraping the sides of the tracks. Like, it just makes your ears hurt so loud. <laughs> and she's all, like, tearful, emotional. She stands up and she goes, all right, fuck this, and walks away. <laughs> And I just, I, <laughs> I like, I was like, oh boy, she's angry. She's upset. She's upset. I got to calm her down. And then when I went home, like I laughed the whole way home about it. I thought it was the most comical thing I've ever seen. Like <laughs> to go from like the, the emotions of crying and then just to be like, oh, screw this. You know, she like snapped out of that moment. It was just so funny. And I just, I think about it every day. It's such my favorite moments of the movie. We sometimes forget that they are actually actors. Yes. <laughs> that they're acting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it was just like something that I, I find was pretty humorous. I'm like, ah, yeah, it's always good to laugh about that now. But during the day, I was like, oh, she's upset. Oh, boy, I got to keep her happy and grounded now. I'm like, oh, it's not going to happen again. And it didn't. But that was like the one time it was the very first take. I'm like, of course, it was a first take. And so. she probably I'm going to guess felt like she was in it, that she had it. Oh, I mean, I can see the tears in her eyes. I mean, she was in it because I know like, I think we did five takes actually, but like she didn't want to even do a, a, another take after a while because it was so draining. And I said, well, we're going to look the other way and film the other actor. So you don't have to do that performance again. She goes, yes, I do. It's for the other actor. I have to give her something. And I was like, wow. And, he, and she showed me how invested she is and how she works. I mean, she doesn't stop. I mean, she just, it's like, even when we filmed her in the diner, there's a shot where her kid's coughing her grandson's coughing and she's delivering the same performance, knowing that she's not even on camera at all. She's still getting upset and emotional. And I'm like, she cares that much. And there's not many people out there who do like that. That's the mark of what I think of as a real pro. Yeah, extremely. Yeah. Someone who's giving back no matter whether they're on camera or not. So last question for you today, Richard, you've already given us just an enormous amount of great useful information and, and advice throughout the show. But I'm wondering if you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you like to give those who are starting out in the business, or maybe they're in a little bit trying to get to the next level. Well, I would, I would say, you know, for my advice, because people ask me a lot, is like, don't stop. I kind of got inspired by Stallone, you know, years ago who made Rocky and, you know, he fought to keep himself in the movie to be the actor in the movie and they wanted to put somebody else in the movie and he wanted to do it himself. They wouldn't let him do it at first, but he fought and he saw it through where he wrote it and he was the actor in the movie. And it really inspired me. And that's why like I have worked so hard to make my own projects because 
people don't come to your door and say, Hey, I got a movie for you. Here's a million dollars. Go make it. You have to do it yourself and find a way to make that project. And, you know, if you don't do it, it'll never happen. And then you'll just be this person later in life who complains about, well, I could have done this if I had money, but like, you just have to find a way. You have to find a way to make your dreams come true. And that's what I did. I asked favors of all my friends, you know, like, Hey, can you come do this movie with me for this little bit of money? And I promise you, I'll get you more work later, you know, and they did. And it helped really uh, solidify the film. And I never gave up, even when money was an issue. It's like, you have to keep moving forward and you can't stop. And even if like things are difficult and you want to be a filmmaker, it's like, and you're not getting the calls for work, you have to keep going because eventually the phone will start getting busy. You'll get, in call you'll get calls. Uh, you're sort of spoiling it for everyone who thinks that the <laughs> world is just going to come crawling to them saying, come yeah. on, you've got to make the movie and here's $25 million. That wanna, just it doesn't happen. It doesn't that way. happen. <laughs> no, no I, I talked to Ryan Johnson years ago and he was like, he's like, if you, if I can tell you anything else, make your own movies because eventually somebody's going to want to buy it. I think that that is really sound, solid advice. And by the way, pretty much the only way that you really learn how to do it is just oh, going yes. out and doing it. Exactly. You have to, you have to learn by your mistakes. And that's something that I do. It's like whenever I make a movie or a project, I always go home and think, what what didn't I do right today? It's like, what can I do better tomorrow? And that's how you should address it. Not just like, oh, I know everything. You shouldn't always learn something from the day. Also, really excellent advice is that you're able to self-analyze as to how you can grow from what you've done rather than just sitting and resting on your laurels. Exactly. exactly. Richard Bakewell, this has been an absolutely wonderful hour on Storybeat, and I can't thank you enough for your time and your wisdom and your energy and just for telling us all about you and your career and your the stuff that you've done forever. So I thank you kindly. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Story Beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.